Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this is Cycle webinar. My name is Robin Williams, and I am one of the regional directors responsible for the Cape region. And I'll be co-hosting this webinar today with our KZN regional director, Nolan Hassani. So today marks quite a big day for us in South Africa and most people to African businesses. And this is the first, as the first to lie, if the day properly becomes effective after having a 12 month grace period. I think it's safe to say that today it's Poppy Eve, and in celebration of Poppy Eve, we're going to be bringing two well first speakers that will be talking around themes of data privacy and Poppy. So I'm very delighted to see that we have quite a good attendance uptake for this event. I see still a lot of people logging in. So just before we get started, I'd just like to share a few housekeeping items with you. So firstly, if you can please ensure that your mics are on mute and your cameras are off, just to eliminate any background noise during the webinar and during our presenters' presentations. If you have any questions, you can submit them at any time during the webinar by simply using the chat pane at the bottom of your screen. We do have a dedicated question answer slots at the end of our second speaker's presentation where your questions will be answered. Uh, just to take note that we are doing this a bit differently this time, um, as today's presentation is more of a panel discussion than individual um, presentations. So the question session will be facilitated by my co-host Nolan towards the end of the session. If you need your, uh, if you need any attention urgently during the webinar uh, for whatever reason, you can either raise your hand um, by using the raise hand facility, or you can send us a direct message to the Sarkis Atkin chapter account. Um, also, just to note that this event will be recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. Um, the name of the soccer, um, the channel is the Sarkis Atkin chapter. So if you'd like to watch this webinar or any of our previous webinars, please log into YouTube and check it under our channel. And then lastly, uh, this webinar will earn you two and a half CPE hours. The confirmation of attendance um, and CP certificate will be emailed um, to your registered email address that you use for this webinar. Okay, then for some news and updates. Um, as most of you know, um, we have been accredited and recognized as a professional body by the South African Qualifications Authority, um, which many of us know SAKWA. Um, this has been quite a long and tedious process for us to get to the point, but it means that you know, through this accreditation, we can offer a lot more value to our members by utilizing many of the avenues that this accreditation brings, um, such as the creation of designations and there's many more other initiatives. Um, in due course, we'll hold some sort of celebration to celebrate this momentous occasion. And um, I almost think that this took us almost seven years um, to, to get to this point. But really well done, you know, to the chapter and well done to all those that's been involved in this process. And then on designations, so we encourage everyone to continue to apply for these professional designations and at, at absolutely no cost. Uh, there is an application form that you can complete, um, which you can either uh, download off the SAC Engage website, or you can email our office at SACWA that is software.org.za for the applications. Um, for this, it's, um, you can apply for the ISMS or the ISA, uh, which is equivalent to our CISA and our FISM um, certifications. So if you want more information, please do reach out to the office or you can get more information on the SACO website. And if you require any training, we have you covered. Um, we have two certification workshops um, scheduled during July and August. Um, our first workshop will be a SISM exam review workshop, which will be uh, facilitated by our past chapter president, um, Tich Zoro, uh, which starts on the 3rd of July and will be held every single Saturday from the 3rd of July from 9 to 4 o'clock. And then we have our second uh, exam review workshop, which is on CISDA. Um, this will be done from the 7th of August um, by Zulpika Ali, who is our accredited CISA um, trainer. And this will be every Saturday from 9 to 1 o'clock. The prices for both these workshops are 1,125 Rand for members. And then for non-members, it's 1,250 Rand. So for more details, you can uh, get the information on our SACA website. 
or you can email the office and they'll gladly assist you. And then we just come off of completing our conference um, in the month of June. And, you know, in, in pure, like uh, in good fashion, we always plan one year in advance. So for 2022, we'll be hosting a hybrid event, uh, which is going to be both person and virtual. And the dates that we have planned in Pennsylvania and the 23rd of July, sorry, August of, uh, next year. The in-person event will be in Empress Palace if you want to attend it in person. Otherwise, you can attend the event um, from the comfort of your own home um, on our, our virtual platform, uh, which is all going to be on the 22nd to the 23rd of August. And in pure Tarko style, we do have a pre-conference workshop and a post-conference workshop. Our pre-conference workshop will be on the 18th to the 19th of August 2022. Um, there will be two events for the pre-conference workshop. The first one will be IT for non-IT auditors, which is two days. Or you could choose the option of doing a CSX fundamentals workshop, which is also two days. Um, for a post-conference workshop, we have three events listed or three options for you. Uh, this will be on the 24th to the 25th of August, 2022. Uh, the first option is a CSA exam preparation workshop, which is two days. Is a TSA exam preparation workshop, which is another two days, or you could register for the cybersecurity for auditors, which is also a two day workshop. Um, please do take note that there is a super early bird discount. So if you'd like to take advantage of this, um, contact the office either at info at .org or by the contact number listed on your screen. And so on the conference, uh, we are looking for organizations or individuals to sponsor our event. Um, sponsorship packages do range from about 4,000 Rand up until about 21,000 Rand. You can refer to the SARC Engage website for more information regarding the different sponsorship packages that are offered and the benefit that each package uh, provides. Uh, we are also looking for speakers at a hybrid conference event. So if you are interested in speaking or presenting, um, you can submit your application to our office um, via the SACA email address listed on the screen. Okay, and then on to the main part of our event and introducing our first speaker of two that will be presenting and sharing the experiences of Poppy. Our first speaker's name is Gerald Toy, uh, who is one of Stanbosch University's two deputy information officers under the South Africa's Promotion of Access Information Act and Protection of Personal Information Act. Um, over Gerald's career, he has worked on large ERP implementations. He's conducted advisory work as a member of a big four audit firm. He served as a member of a university research ethics committee and placed as a finalist in an international game design and talent contest. Today, Gerald regularly contributes to the African higher education sector privacy focus initiatives and is also a past board member of the Sarkis Active Chapter, and he's the current chair of the Chapter Social and Ethics Committee. Uh, he holds a Master's in Social Informatics from Stanimash University, as well as a CISA, a SIDIPSI, and a SIDIPSI um, uh, certification, and he's currently busy with his doctoral studies. So please welcome me in introducing or welcoming um, Gerald. Over to you, Gerald. Thanks, Robin. Right. Well, now just take over the screen sharing. There we go. Hello, everybody, and thank you for, for joining us on Popia Eve. I know you had lots of choices to spend this joyous occasion, and I'm glad that you chose to be with us today. Let's get into it. All right, it's the night before Papier. The act goes live tomorrow, 1 July. And what we're seeing uh, in our personal lives and in our corporate lives and our business lives, there seems to be a, a, lot of, a lot of individuals waking up a little bit late 
to the idea that Popea is, is coming along and have begun to panic a bit. And we're seeing a, a fair number of knee-jerk reactions to Papia. And sometimes these fear-based approaches or these very quick solutions run the risk of doing a bit more harm than, well, good. So to start off the conversation, the act goes live tomorrow, but is non-compliance with the act our biggest risk? And when we think about risks surrounding personal information or the processing of personal information, before the risk of non-compliance, I like to consider a few others. These include, for example, simply data loss, a spilled cup of coffee on a laptop, and we've lost some information, or the laptop is stolen, it falls off a table, simple data loss. Then what about a, an actual data breach or an information leak? That, that's a risk too that might revolve around personal information. And then there's of course the reputational costs of such a breach. Information breaches have both direct costs and indirect costs. Direct costs in terms of a fine, for example, from, from, from the information regulator, but indirect costs to loss of sales into the future. So when we look at personal information, non-compliance, yes, yes, that is a risk, but there are other risks that have existed before 1 July 2021 and have existed for decades and are, have been there all along. The real risks around personal information. We have a leak, it gets into the news. Our organization faces reputational uh, impact, media scrutiny, but then there's also the real harm done to the individuals affected by the leak based on what the information was or what the information contained. That's the real risk. And that has always been there Yes, Papia will add a, a level of, let's call it complexity from tomorrow, should we, should we have a breach then? But that doesn't change the inherent risk of the breach event. So the way I like to look at privacy is that privacy is not a discipline unto itself. Privacy a well, good privacy solution relies on a host of other disciplines working well already. So the act, for example, explicitly calls out security, information security, cybersecurity. We can't have a good privacy solution without good security, but we don't have good security because privacy law tells us to. We have good security for having good security. If we think about the core of security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. Integrity, that's making sure that our information is protected against unwanted edits or changes or corruption. We want that because we want to know that when we make a decision based on our data, that we're making a good decision based on good data. Garbage in, garbage out. So that's why we practice that aspect of security because we want that peace of mind that we were working with quality data. Yes, Papia mentions quality of information too, but we're, doing, we, we're ensuring good quality information for business reasons before we even consider compliance with legislation. Then if we look at the A of security, availability of information, we want that peace of mind, knowing that we can recover our information in a reasonable time after an event such as a flood in a data center or ransomware, for example. We want that peace of mind that we will be able to continue with our work 
after an event. And yes, Papier speaks about this too, but the reason we, we invest in our backup solutions and our, and our business continuity solutions and our disaster recovery solutions is not because Papier tells us to do it. It's because it's a much easier going to sleep at night knowing that our information is safe. So let's not panic specifically about Papier. At a minimum, Papier gives us a good common sense checklist with which to consider these other disciplines I've mentioned and some others to, for example, include records management and the research context, it's research data management. But Pia provides a good common sense checklist for us. What have we got in place? And if we have those in place, we're a long way to being Papier compliant. And if you don't have those in place yet, then you have different reasons to panic other than Papier going live tomorrow. Then at its best, privacy legislation or, or privacy programs, they encourage or they drive us to innovate, to do better, to seek out efficiencies and effectiveness in our processes. At its best, privacy drives that sort of, let's think about, think about this again. Just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean it's the best, that now's a good opportunity to rethink what we're doing. That's privacy at its best. So good news, at one minute past midnight, the world is not going to end. And so for us who have been doing all these other disciplines and tackling them well, we're probably mostly compliant. And for those who aren't, it's still not too late. Papia isn't this major watershed moment that prevents us from doing better tomorrow than we have done today. So even if you have not got the best records management program in place with the perfect data disposal processes, it's not too late to start investing and investigating your options tomorrow. We can still improve as we go along. Now, before I continue with the rest of my presentation, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So I'm just gonna briefly discuss some Papier basics. I am not going to go into all of it. I'm sure we've, we've heard about the eight conditions often enough. I'm just gonna focus on the elements that are necessary to, to follow along today. And at its core, all personal information must be processed lawfully. And within the act, there are several lawful justifications available for the processing of information. And to figure out which one applies, if any apply, six simple questions. Is the process necessary for the conclusion of a performance of a contract? Is it necessary for compliance with an obligation imposed by law? Is it necessary to protect a legitimate interest of a data subject? For the proper performance of a public law duty by a public body? Or for the protection of a legitimate interest of the responsible party or third party? And if none of the others, none of the others apply, do you have consent to conduct the processing? So what I'm gonna start highlighting next are a few examples of where we've encountered a knee-jerk response to Papia. And we're gonna unpack what that, what that has led to. Has it, has it complicated matters further? Has it promoted actual compliance? Or has it made things less compliant? It's also an option. And as we discuss it, I'd like us to remember these, these justifications. 
right? So it's for contract, duty under law, legitimate interest, or with consent of the data subject. All right, our first not quite good practice, purging our databases. How many of us here, or how, let's ask it this way. How many of us today have not received a message from one of our service providers asking us to reconsent or opting once again to a newsletter? I think it's going to be very few of us have not received such a message in recent weeks. Now the question is, do we need to do that? And what happens if a client does not provide that consent again? What happens to our database then? Do we need to purge our database of contacts? Now, before we want to go further, I want us to think about the value of our database. Information has value. We can expect a certain return on investment on our mailing lists. If we cannot expect a, a return, why, why, why bother keeping them? Right? So there must be some value in our databases. When we're looking at this as, as an auditor, we'd say, all right, what is the value of this information to a malicious user? How can they use this information to execute a phishing campaign or a spam campaign, for example? And then information has a value to malicious users. But then what is the value within our organization? How many leads do we generate from our, our marketing campaigns that uses this database? Right. So if we can agree that our database has value, we'd want to take steps to protect that database, either from abuse or misuse, and also to uh, protect it from loss because we would like to use that information. We find value in that information. So now if, if you go out and you send a, a message to everybody on the database, as part of our commitment to privacy, we'd like to tell you about our privacy journey and what steps we're taking to protect your personal information, blah, blah, blah. Would you please reconsent to our mailing list? Then, if the, then we've got to think about, right, how many of our clients would actually read that mail? Are we certain that we're going to have a 100% coverage and every one of our clients is going to read it, firstly? So already you run the risk of losing clients that would have reconsented if they even read your message. then you're going to have a whole bunch that think, ah, all right, well, no, I won't reconsent now that you've asked. And then you, you effectively begin shrinking your database and it starts losing its value. So the interesting thing about Papia, it doesn't ask us to do go through this exercise or necessarily ask us to go through this exercise of re-consenting or re-opting in. Papia rather is about asking us to properly think about our database and ask, ask some, not necessarily easy questions, but ask ourselves, do we know where we got this information from? Do we have a do we have a record of of somebody of the data subject signing up to it? How recently have we collected this information? How reliable is our unsubscribe mechanism? Papia so forces us to ask these sort of questions and take a risk based approach to our database. Now, for those questions I've just asked, if you've answered no to one or more of them, then, then maybe you weren't doing things in the best way possible originally. Then you may need to consider, all right, if we haven't done this in the best way possible, 
what next? Right? Only then, only then when you've come to that position, like, all right, we admit we've not done this in the best way, the way we've harvested this information, the mechanisms we use to collect that information were not necessarily above board. Only then do you need to consider reconsenting. And when you reach that point, it's still not a game over situation. You can take the time to, to think about your messaging and how you craft it. Focus on your unsubscribe options, for example, rather than your re-opting functions. All right, so many of us have seen this. Some of us on today's talk or oh, in, in today's session might, might even be guilty of this, sending out these not quite good practice. Another one, consent by default. This, this is a, this is a quite a quite a common occurrence which where we see companies rely on consent as their primary justification for processing personal information where you had five other options to consider as well and if you think back on that slide i put consent at the bottom i didn't even put it in the numbered list because consent is really, really difficult to manage. So as defined in Popia, consent means any voluntary, specific and informed expression of will. And the data subject must be able to withhold or withdraw that consent at any time. So the very fact that an individual may withdraw or withhold their consent at any time means that you need to be able to manage that consent. You need to remember when you collected it, you need to be able to action a request or action a withdrawal of consent as well. And we've seen many scenarios where companies have relied on consent when engaging with individuals as customers, but we've also strangely seen that in business to business transactions as well. Now, let me give you some practical examples of when consent is not the best option. So for, for a first rather glib example, imagine if at your company, HR had to ask you to please consent provide your consent so that they may process your banking information so that they may pay your monthly salary. What happens if I withhold as an employee then? What happens if I withhold my consent in this case? Can I, can I still get paid? So when considering consent as a justification, we need to ask ourselves what happens when the data subject withholds their consent. If the process breaks, fundamentally breaks down, then perhaps consent is not the best mechanism to use. So in the case of an employer and employee relationship, there is an employment agreement in place. So there we go to the justification in Papia it's in fulfillment of a contract. Now, out in the wild, I've seen some strange, strange requests. Uh, one in particular comes to mind where the company reached out to their clients with whom they have an existing agreement. And this is part of our journey under Papia. Uh, we respect your privacy. Let us tell you about what, what we're doing about our privacy journey, what we do with your personal information. Nice, nice cover letter. Then they're going to, all right, we need you to provide consent for the following. 
processing of your information in order to fulfill our contract with you. Right, already that's, that's a warning bell. Why, why would you need that when the contract already provides what you're gonna do with the information, what information you require from me, how often you're gonna use it, et cetera, et cetera. But then this particular example goes further. Next slide, provide consent to receive direct marketing from us. Next line, direct marketing from third party partners, et cetera, et cetera. And then provides but one field to consent to all of the above or none of the above. Now that becomes very, very messy. So what we've got here now is, is a mix of mandatory, required communications, et cetera, or processing under a contract versus a whole bunch of options. I have the, I have the option to to unsubscribe from direct marketing. But now that you've bundled them together, I can't, I can't have just the mandatory. I have to have, I have to have the adverts with it as well. And that's not the right way to handle consent. What we've, what we've got to do there is we've got to think about every communication that we send out and, and define what is mandatory and what is optional. And what is optional, that's where we can build in your opt-ins, our unsubscribes, et cetera. So for example, in the university space where I work, there are mandatory messages that we need to send out. So for example, with the change in lockdown regulations, we need to be able to communicate quickly with individuals about what does this mean for you? What does this mean about your classes? What does this mean about your assessments? What does this mean about where you're going to go sleep tonight in terms of those who live in university residences? You can't opt out of such communications. They're vital that we must reach you with this. But there are a whole host of other things that we can consider as, as optional. Uh, house dance, for example, that's, that's an optional message. And for that sort of thing, there we can consider opting out. We've also seen some strange things at a business to business level. For example, I've seen one vendor, one vendor, as part of their third party risk management, asking their clients uh, to, to submit to a third party risk assessment, but positioning the client as the operator under Papier rather than the responsible party, which only leads to causing confusion, lost man hours. If, if you send us, if a business as part of their third-party risk management sends us a really confusing approach to Papia, or confused approach to Papia rather, it's not going to land very well. As a, as a university, for example, we often do once-off research projects with organizations. Now, as part of these organizations, approach to third-party risk management in Papia, which they should do. You must have some measure of this in place. But a lot of these organizations have taken a very blunt approach to it and attempting a one-size-fits-all approach ranging from their, their embedded third parties who look after their crown jewel systems to a once-off vendor that once did a small bit of work on the other side. And these blunt approaches, at the minimum, confuse, spreads more confusion, but also doesn't allow for much nuance and doesn't enhance compliance in any real way. So as an example, within the university, we've 
got one third party trying to for us to adopt coding standards, but we've never offered or engaged in any sort of coding with this third party before. Our research projects have been limited in scope. Um, and in no way touch coding of, of any sort. And these blunt approaches do more harm than good. They, they, they chew up uh, internal legal advisory hours, back and forth emails, et cetera. Rather, in this, in this context, a risk-based approach would have been much smoother you know, figuring out that these blunt approaches consent for everything by default or one size fit all approaches are not the best ways to, to promote compliance or ensure compliance. So that in brief was a, a few examples of where a knee jerk reaction to Papier has led to a Let's call it a confused, a, a confused response. And these confused responses don't strengthen compliance on the one hand, but also cause confusion on the other hand and may cause some processes to break. So if we are asking our clients to consent to being billed and they refuse consent, are we unable to build them? So what I'm advocating today is, you know, yes, Papia is tomorrow, but if we, if we panic about them and we rush out a solution, we, we try and air quote, save our mailing list by sending out a proactive Papia reconsent message, we may be doing more harm than good. And it's important for us to, to not lose our cool. Yes. The act goes into full effect tomorrow, but is the information regulator going to be knocking on your door at one past midnight to shut you down? It's highly unlikely that's going to happen to you or your organization. So even though the act goes live, privacy remains not a point in time compliance effort. It's more of a continuous striving to do better. So the day after Papier, it's not the end of the world. Right? We can sleep, or at least Papier should not be keeping you awake tonight. It forces us to meet a minimum standard and encourages us to innovate and do better but we need to balance that. We, we mustn't be overzealous in our application of the peer and end up doing more harm than good. And that harm may come in the fact in, in, in the shape of ending up purging our own valuable databases to sowing confusion amongst our clients or potentially breaking our own internal business processes. And that's my piece for now. I think I'll hand over back to Nolan. Thanks a lot, Gerald. Um, okay, guys, so I've got our next speaker lined up, Jerusha. Jerusha is one of Stellenbosch University's two deputy information officers under South Africa's Promotion of Access to Information Act and Protection of Personal Information Act. She currently serves as a member of the Academic and Relations and Education Committee for the Isaka South Africa chapter. She possesses a LLB degree and has practiced as an attorney, legal consultant, and assisted as a compliance functionary. She also loves plants and enjoys receiving flowers. So uh, I guess, Andre, that's a note for us to remember, eh? Shusha, on to you next. 
Thank you so much. Thanks to Raul for starting us off with um, some of those mistakes that we can avoid in just keeping our customers and our internal clients very happy um, by not spamming them unnecessarily. The reason I decided to speak about minding our own business today is, unfortunately, I've been on the receiving end of some of these very bad practices. And um, I've had people reach out to me and um, say to me, Jerusha, you know, there's a, a 1 July deadline. And uh, I'm quite aware that there's a 1 July deadline. And uh, the panic stations hit simply because in certain instances, there is a not understanding of, of basic terminology. And uh, someone has confused a privacy policy with a privacy notice. And uh, when they were made aware that, you know, a notice is a quick exercise and a privacy policy, not so much, um, we can share our quick wins with our clients. And so um, today, instead of hitting panic stations, we can revisit our privacy notices and we may have prepared them very well in advance for the 1st of July deadline. But now is really an important time to relook at our notices and relook at best practice and um, just take to heart what, what can we achieve with a really good privacy notice. And um, so I find when I'm dealing with large pieces of legislation and interpretations that I need some So you're going to see some uh, music references pop up on your screen. Um, please park them and don't uh, focus in on why do we present our clients with these privacy notices. And I'm not going to rehash the grounds of justification. I've laid them out for you um, in terms of section 27. But when someone comes to you and says, do I need a privacy notice? The first thing we need to remember is that although the Act gives us a lot of guidelines, it does not specifically state that there should be a privacy notice. However, we have um, learned from the GDPR that this is one of the best ways in terms of informing our clients um, and not bogging them down with unnecessarily unnecessary documentation. Um, and so this privacy notice session is basically just to get us charged up again for what is lying ahead of us in terms of the Papier journey. And for those of you who have your notices in place, uh, well done, it is a quick win. For those of you who are not yet there, as Gerald stated, don't panic um, and let's work this, this journey together. Um, I've placed a trigger warning for those of you that are not aware about the, um, the Greek pilots that murdered his wife. I know it's a very macabre example to use, but it's a very real and true reminder to us again that privacy, as Sheryl said, is not a discipline of its own. And often we get so excited to be in our own little privacy biospheres that we forget that we exist amongst the community. And sometimes in that community, bad things happen. I point to this example because, you know, technology was very key um, in terms of successfully prosecuting this man. Um, he fabricated evidence. He removed a memory card from, from the CCTV cameras in his home. However, there was other evidence um, at the crime scene that the police were able to use in order to successfully close an investigation and bring him to task. So we've got to remember that when we are dealing in our Popia bubbles, that certain other pieces of legislation will also come into play. And because of my legal and compliance background, 
Um, I like to look at what different biospheres people are floating in. So, for example, if an access to information request comes in, that will trigger certain provisions um, and certain provisions such as what is in a public interest may override PAPIA. So it's very important that when we look at PAPIA, we don't just look at it as a single piece of legislation outside of the broader principles of our constitution. So that's just a, a real and true life example that we can use to say when we are prepared, as much as we are preparing our customers, hey customer, <laughs> this is what I'm using your information for, this is how I'm processing your information, this is where I'm processing it, that we do not forget our internal stakeholders. Um, if you are operating CCTV cameras, for example, at your work premises, um, and you're doing this as part of your due diligence, you're doing this so that maybe you can get a reduced rate on your insurance. Just remember, if those cameras happen to pick up something, there is a possibility that you could be served with a warrant that that camera footage be presented as evidence. Um, and it could be varied. So don't only think of Popia as your one true source of when information can and should be shared. So I looked at Fitbit's privacy notice. Um, it's a really great privacy notice. And I just want to highlight a section that they have put inside their privacy notice, which says that they are collecting the information to promote the safety and security of the, their services their users and other parties. And then they just slip in there in very plain English, you know, they can use this information to respond to a legal request or claim. So every word that we use in a privacy policy should be measured and should have a purpose. I had to revisit a privacy policy, a privacy notice, now I'm getting them mixed up, a privacy notice with a client where in the past they had a lot of, they were working with a lot of third party entities. Um, and so there was a lot of data transfers back and forth. It happens with research sometimes. But you know, those research um, arrangements, those research contracts, they are not indefinite. And so the research contracts in certain instances come to an end and it is required of, of that party that is processing the data to update their notice so that their users are aware of where their information is going, of who it is being shared with, especially if it is sensitive information. And so we should be tiniest in terms of how we're looking at our privacy notices and how we are placing them in our cycles for renewal. And I don't say, um, do this every six months. That is not reasonable or practical. But keep your eye out on what the information regulator is saying. Keep your eye out on your cl client needs and how you appropriately and timeously. So just back on smart devices and um, their uses and their privacy notices, in general, Section six in terms of the POPIA says that the act does not apply to the processing of personal information in the course of a purely personal or household activity. So it is not always an interrelated response, although it could be. Again, it depends on the nature of your business. So your wording to your clients should be very clear um, and make it very plain as to what your le legal obligations are and um, just align with their expectations. Now, it's not always possible to have your client 100% happy, but if there is an expectation and you are not prepared with an answer, um, that can just deteriorate the relationship. So in order to maintain our relationships and to ensure that we are giving them the most correct and ap applicable information, 
we need to align our notices to what legislation requires of us. I had a look at the most wonderful article by the Data and Marketing Association. And the article was written by Tim Rowe, and he is the chair of the GDPR task force. And he puts these principles into very plain language English. Um, now, before some of you uh, fall asleep and think I missed the assignment that this is a peer session, we look at best practices and we can take some of these principles and we can repurpose them for our own Popia use. So it is very important that when we are um, working towards best practice, that we are aware of what is already out there, that we do not reinvent the cycle and we don't, do not verbally vomit all over our clients and our stakeholders. Transparency is key um, and transparency is the key to trust. So we do want to have these levels of trust within our own organizations, but also with our external stakeholders as well. I think the first question that any um, customer would come to you with is, but why should I even care? Um, if you are working with a visionary client, you might get this quite a lot. They have their eye focused on their research or on their projects. Um, they have the end game in sight. Um, and often they just want to share information with any and all interested parties. It is very important that we point them towards, you know, the value of what their data holds um, and how we treat them with the value that they deserve. So again, the transparency and the trust is very key. We don't want our databases exposed because we do not want to deal um, with a fine from the information regulator. We do not want to deal with the fallout from bad publicity. We do not want to lose our clients. We want to retain our clients and we want to grow um, our client bases and we want to grow the relationship with our clients. So being very transparent about how we are processing their data and where we are processing their data is very key. Um, and if the client does not understand this, we need to find a way to make them understand. We need to learn to use the language that the client is using and not overwhelm them either with legal terms or with you know, privacy security terms or IT audit terms that they may not necessarily understand. We're living in a, in a digital age. And so people sharing their data on different platforms in certain instances will require consent. We're not gonna flog the horse of consent. I think Gerald has very beautifully brought us up to speed about it, except to say that it needs to be real and valid and true. Um, and if there is a better mechanism to use, such as a contract in place, rather put the emphasis on the relationship and balancing the relationship with the client than trying to manage the opt-in for this purpose and the opt-out for that purpose. Again, it depends on the nature of your, your business. If you are a company that does a lot of direct marketing, um, it's going to be a, a, a heinous exercise, I hate to say it, but rather a, a large, enormous task that is set before you. Um, for those of us that are working with the more conventional clients, it's much easier to um, just keep those notices short and neat and to the point um, and not unnecessarily burden them with um, consent where they haven't opted in in the first place. 
So some principles that we can, can look at just in terms of our privacy notice is um, explaining the obvious, telling them who you are. If you are an entity that is part of a larger entity, state so very clearly. I am ABC incorporated under whatever, under the banner of this larger company. Let them know exactly who they're dealing with. Don't confuse them, um, but make it clear that you're not being fraudulent in your actions. They're dealing with you, but you are part of a larger business. So that's the first thing. Don't let your customers guess um, because you've gone through a name change process or a change of ownership or whatever it may be. And I'm not sure of all the participants on this call, but especially if you're a, a smaller entity or an entity working with SMMEs that it, and you're working with a joint partnership with someone else, um, make that very clear in terms of the information sharing as well. Make sure that they know that you know your, this is where the data is being held. Um, however, you are working in conjunction with another company. And so this is where the data may be processed. Um, just take them on that journey with you. And it sounds like it's this impossible task, but if your privacy notice is very well put together, you will be able to take them on this journey with you. Um, and it should keep the queries to a minimum. However, in terms of just making your business seamless, ensure that you don't forget, you know, the day-to-day -day, um, menial work that needs to happen. And part of that menial work is ensuring that your staff is trained. And that is reasonable. They should always be able to help their customers and know where they can find the answer or know um, where they can point the customer to um, and work alongside the information officer in your business. There's nothing worse than someone who is frustrated and has a query and has a genuine concern about how their information is being processed or the information of a loved one, possibly a child who's a minor, and they have these reservations and they feel like they're being pushed from pillar to post. So keep that trust, keep that transparency, but ensure that your, your staff is able to carry that along if you for some reason are, are absent for a period of time. I love this picture of uh, Sesame Street. They have a song called the sharing song. <laughs> um, and that's just a reminder again, and, and I've said this and I'm saying it again, if you are sharing the data with others, your customers need to know that you need to be upfront about it. Um, it shouldn't come as a surprise to them. If a breach does occur um, and you reach out to them and say, well, it occurred and this is the instance that it occurred and it wasn't us, it was the per person we're partnering with, that is not gonna fly with your clients and it's not gonna fly with the regulator. So be upfront and be clear uh, with who their information is being shared. So privacy notices, there's nothing worse um, than a long legal document that is just, it makes no sense to anyone. The terms are not clear. It doesn't translate well, it doesn't age well. Some important points to remember are, this information should be given freely. You shouldn't be charging for it. It shouldn't be behind a paywall. If someone needs to have a look at how your privacy notices are drafted or where their information is being shared or how they shouldn't have to wade through an entire policy that requires a degree, a degree in order to understand what is going on. So keep it very simple, very clear, and very plain. Um, don't put everything related to your privacy process in there. 
rather have that separately as an annexure to your privacy policy, which you can publish on your website, you can embed the links, they can go and have a look at it in their own time. But for a privacy notice, it serves really an upfront notification of when they visit your website or when they are signing in on a, a sign in sheet or when they're navigating your website and they want to submit some details on your database that it just it's a nice quick pop up here you go this is okay if you need a copy here's where you can access a copy we have so many different methods available to us in terms of conveying privacy information and um, just we live in this electronic age and it's very, very easy to just simply publish it once and publish it on your website. But remember your customers, remember that certain people, even in this day and age, do not have the same type of access to um, technology as other people. So something that might display very well on your web page may not look so great when they open it up on their phone. It shouldn't be the only uh, place that it is displayed. If they walk into your head office and there's a notice board, it should be proudly displayed on, on your notice board. If you are, um, a company that specializes, for example, with CCTV footage, um, you know, go the extra mile and make sure that they know that once they walk away with uh, whatever product, camera product that you're offering, that the onus is on them to display the signage um, wherever they are making use of that footage. Uh, we can even go old school and you can send them a notification on a flyer or you can distribute that. So there really are really varied methods in terms of communicating. Um, and again, it depends on your client. Um, if you have a client that prefers to have conversations about what is going on, have the conversation with them. Don't inundate them unnecessarily. Um, don't panic them unnecessarily. In terms of communication of the privacy notice, you know, be reasonable. If I'm signing up today to attend an Osaka session next week, I, I don't want to receive notice of how the information will be processed after the session. I want to know in terms of the form that my information is going to be processed so that I can attend the session um, and so that I can get my, my um, CPE points. You know, don't uh, delay unnecessarily. Help your customers and help your clients as far as you can and as reasonably as possible. Um, don't maybe send them the whole privacy notice in one stock standard email. Um, just refer to the important headings. We have a privacy notice available. It's going to tell you very important information, such as where your information is stored, um, who it is being shared with. And if you have a complaint, this is where you can you know, file a complaint with us that we can investigate. Because I come from a, a legal and compliance background, and I know how um, relationships can sour and it can turn into a he said, she said, make sure that you document your evidence well. Make sure that if for some reason you are investigated and the information regulator wants to know, did you ever you know, give sufficient notice? Um, what evidence do you have of your privacy notices being served? That you can say, well, yes, indeed. Actually, on the 1st of July, we sent out a newsletter. Um, and thereafter, uh, and I'm guessing now, but perhaps in the next year, the information regulator would send an update and you can say, and then we made some changes according to what the regulator requires. And thereafter, we sent uh, you know, 
we updated our notice and we just informed our customers that we have updated our notice. It is readily available for them. So have um, a reasonable, moderate approach. Um, do not ride the wave of panic, <laughs> but keep your head above water. Choose your battles effectively um, and take the quick win with a privacy notice. A well-drafted privacy notice um, can keep you out of a lot of trouble. It can assist your clients with their queries. It can just help shoulder some of the PPA burden that we are experiencing at this time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jerusha. Uh, that was a great presentation. And now, um, you know, just because both our speakers covered the, the, the topics were themed with Poppy or Papaya, we are having the Q&A session now. So guys, any questions? You can feel free to uh, raise your hand or post it on the chat. Okay, first question from Bradford. How do we register our papaya policy? Thanks, Bradford. Um, for a policy per se, you don't need to register it anywhere. But um, if you're referring to, there are other things you do need to register for. So for example, information officers and deputy information officers need to register with the information regulator. Um, but perhaps if you can expand on your question a bit, uh, Jerusha and I can tackle it. Oh, I see there's a, a new question while we wait for Bradford. Um, a checklist for privacy notice stakeholders. <laughs> I love that. So in terms of um, what your business is doing or how you are in communication with your clients, um, it really does depend. I've seen, you know, people have it on their website. They send out a newsletter. They, if they are active on social media, that they, they use those channels. Um, so the, the point of the exercise is not to spam someone in terms of now I keep receiving your email, have you read my privacy notice? Have you read my, my privacy notice? But it's more a case of how does this fit into our broader PAPIA compliance? So any a type of notification um, firstly, is only as good as its drafting. And secondly, you know, when you are sending it out, if you can have a quick internal stakeholders meeting, if you can meet with, for example, sales and marketing, legal and compliance, um, if you have a complaints department, those are the types of, of stakeholders that you would want to first check with to ensure that your privacy you know, notice is correct. Um, if, you, if your information officer, um, if their details can appear on that, if they are the go-to person, then their details should appear. If there's a, a general queries, you know, um, contact detail, then that needs to go there. But the point is people should know what is happening with the information that is being processed and they should be able to reach out to someone else 
and receive that assistance and receive that in, uh, assistance timelessly. Um, I think there, there are a few more questions from Bradford and Mr. Singh. I can respond to Bradford quickly and then um, I'll also add something about a privacy notice, if you don't mind. So, so Bradford, on the information officers, uh, the information regulator released a media statement last week. Uh, and part of that statement discussed some of the difficulties with the online registration portal and, and essentially there is now no deadline on having to register our DIOs and IOs until such time that the regulator um, issues a, a further clarification on it. I know that some people have had success on the online portal and I, I encourage you to check in every now and again. Uh, perhaps it is working. And if it is, I, I encourage your, you to register your information officer and your deputy information officer as such. Otherwise, keep an eye on the regulator's website. The media statements go on there. And as soon as the portal is up or there's a new target date, it should be shared there. Then uh, back to privacy notices. One of the one of the big things of, of Papier for me is uh, revol revolves around information quality and and creating a, a sufficient level of trust between ourselves and the data subject so that they uh, provide truthful information, quality information. So sometimes when you create a new take on form, for example, elements of a privacy notice can be right there next to the question where you ask about let's say, for example, identity number or gender identification. And you explain, this is why we are in this. And if you do that in plain language, you're more likely to get a, a truthful answer. Right? Because uh, uh, one way, if, if I can get into a place without needing to tell the truth, and then I will. That's one of my own personal information. My personal security strategies is to pollute my personal information where I can. If I'm unsure or, or, or do not trust the, the one asking for the information fully. All right, um, then Thanson about a, is it necessary to develop an internal policy to regulate employee behavior? So again, looking at what our information regulator said, and it is the responsibility of the information officer of an organization to ensure that adequate training and awareness mechanisms are pushed throughout the organization. And a privacy policy is probably one of the best ways to, to build such an awareness program or, or upon which to build such an awareness program. So if, if, for whatever reason, you're ever under investigation by the regulator. They're going to check some a few basics. Have you done these few reasonable basics? Yes or no. And they will they will look for the policy. Uh, your internal auditors probably already look for the policy. Um, they will look how have you how have you trained your employees, etc. They'll look at. What, what efforts have you put in making them aware of their responsibilities, et cetera. So that will be tested. So in that sense, yes, such a policy would be necessary. All right, uh, Jim Green, you ask a, a really good one. Um, for peer scope includes the personal information of juristic persons. Can you give examples of what is considered as personally identifiable information for juristic persons? This is a, this is a really tricky one because internationally, uh, most jurisdictions don't make that, uh, or rather focus on natural living persons. So it is a lot trickier for us to give uh, good solid examples, especially when we look at other pieces of legislation that govern our companies and organizations. 
So for example, if you were to go onto SIPSI's website, there's a whole host of information you can find there about juristic persons, or there might be other there might be other types of information that are better covered by other pieces of legislation as well. I can say we can do a bit more research for you, um, try and answer offline in a bit more detail. Jerusha, I don't know if you have anything to add on this one, though. I don't think um, anything at this time, Gerald. Again, it's it depends on the nature of the business. I mean, if you uh, are an, if you're an auditor, for example, you're going to have access to um, quote unquote PII of a business. You're going to be able to see all the documents that they've you know <laughs> had to issue to stars. You're going to have to do those checks. But just in a general sense. Um, you know, that information might not be published somewhere unless it's published in terms of an invoice to someone. Um, so yeah, we can definitely check up on that and, and get back to the person asking the requester. Um, there's a really interesting question. I'm going to just uh, skip to it where someone has asked about the minimum compliance requirements that could be shared and I just want to encourage every person that is an ISACA member <laughs> to get uh, a hold of some of the resources that we have on hand and have a look you know at the COVID 2019 framework it's not uh, specifically geared towards peer compliance but um, I'm going to ask Gerald to, to jump in because I know he he had a really great time um, <laughs> you know, working with that framework and uh, it, it did form part of his M. So uh, I'm passing the buck to him on that Okay, one. thanks. So um, as, as I said in, in, in my session, um, privacy involves you doing a whole host of other things well together. And Jerusha has given a great suggestion. So COVID-2019 um, positions a host of necessary components for a, a governance framework. And I, if you give me half a minute, I will find the list and, and, and share it. Okay, um, while, Gerald, I think while you, while you get your half a minute, um, Anri from Isaka South Africa has asked, will the information regulator be issuing ind industry type guidelines or best practices? Um, I know in leading up to Papia going live, there was a lot of consultation that the information regulator did. And they, they are working on some guidelines and some guidance notes. Their website is, in, is open. Um, you're welcome to go and have a look. And in terms of just where your area of practice is, um, your in your particular industry might be putting together some some best practice guidelines and some codes of, of good practice um, that they would want the information regulator to sign off on. Um, so at this time, I mean, we are the university space, so we've got two entities that have been working on a code of good practice, and the one is University South Africa. So again, there's some really good nuggets in there. If you go and have a look at the code, um, it is over 200 pages. So I think you will find what you're looking for. It's also written in plain English, which is also helpful. Um, the other entity is more for researchers and that's the Academy of Social Sciences South Africa and they're working on their own code, but that might not be applicable to, to everyone in this room. So already out there, there's a lot about, um, you know, just bringing this papier into a reasonable space within your business and assisting people in, um, I don't want I don't want to say overthinking Papia, but yes, overthinking Papia and maybe putting unreasonable constraints um, on limited resources. So uh, there's a question regarding internal auditors. I am not an, an internal auditor. So if there is an internal auditor on the chat that is perhaps 
aware <laughs> of PEER audits and the scopes of coverage, you're welcome to take that question. Um, I, can, I can take a stab, Jerusha. Um, go for it. I've also found my COVID-2019 20, references. Right, but first on the internal audit, uh, well, take a risk-based approach. All right. um, um, for example, you, you depending on the, the, the setup of your organization, you might find that you need to focus your audit on the information officer and the deputy information officer level against the guidance notes that the information regulator has released. But if, for example, you know that that part of your organization is, is mature enough, you have formally designated and dele delegated information officers and deputy information officers as may be required, they've got policies, et cetera, in place, then maybe the audit needs to be focused on how well have those policies been implemented. Um, so it's a discussion you'll need to have when looking at the audit plan. Uh, assessing your current maturity, where you'd like to be and taking it from there. There is no one size fits all for, for all institutions. Uh, for example, at, at our, our university, uh, an, an audit could focus on our function, our policies, the training material we, we roll out, the templates we provide, et cetera. But then next year's audit then would be like, how are these templates being used within the organization? So it, it really depends where you are, but I'd recommend a, a risk-based approach as you would uh, formulate an audit plan for, for any area in the university. Uh, then getting back to the questions on the elements or minimum requirements for a framework. So at Stellenbosch University, we developed a, for ourselves a framework for the governance of personal information. This was customized to meet our needs. Uh, so for example, we are a research intensive university. So we needed to consider research ethics, uh, health research ethics, research ethics, uh, human research ethics, social, behavioral, economic, et cetera. So our, our needs are probably or likely to be a bit different from most on the call today, but we developed a framework. And what we used to help develop that framework was COVID-2019. Um, and within it, we used, uh, we focused a lot on how COVID uh, features a life cycle of information firstly, and then also presents a series of what they call in 2019 as components of a governance structure or framework. And in COVID-5, they called them enablers. I really like the word enabler in this sense. It's like what you need to enable a successful governance program. So we translated that into a successful privacy program. And I, I, half an hour now is not enough time to get into all of it, but I'll, I'll list the enablers slash components quickly. You needed to consider process your organizational structures, information flows, then people skills and competencies, then policies and procedures, then culture, ethics and behavior, and then finally your services, infrastructure and applications. So for example, when we get to people skills and competencies and culture, ethics and behavior, that's in our framework, that's where we look at training and awareness requirements. And I link that to an earlier discussion on, on policy, on the ex earlier question on policy. So part of our framework for personal information includes training and awareness. We conducted a training and awareness stakeholder analysis. So in our context, we have administrative staff, we have lecturing staff, we have research staff, we have students. Students can be undergraduate, postgraduate, Students can have employee-like access based on student leadership roles. And then we have prospective students and prospective employee, employees, and then we have alumni. So we had to, using the COVID-2019 framework in that way allowed us to tackle our questions of training and awareness. So 
not a not a bulletproof answer, but I hope it's a as a as a good starting point. Then I see that Anri, thank you, has been collating the questions. One is how independent should the information officer be from business operations? This is an excellent question because in the EU, they explicitly discuss data protection officer independence. But if we look at South African guidance notes on the matter, they're, they're more clear or they clearly state that the, info, the deputy information officer or information officer must be an employee of the, of the organization. So there is less focus on independence from a South African position. So what I would recommend in this sense is look at both models and then look at your own business and try and figure out what is best. Because there's also a question of authority. Uh, does your information officer and deputy information officer have the necessary authority to do their job as well? And you've got to weigh that up with independence as well. What sort of relationship do you want and also the size of your organization. If you're a small organization, you can't have independence really or truly. Uh, so I would recommend look at both resources, the European approach, which is very clear on independence, um, authority, uh, protection for the DPO and compare it to the South African version and then find that middle ground that works for your organization. All right, uh, Henri, please let us know if we miss anything. All right, uh, I think Jerusha, you answered the one about the industry type guidelines while I was looking about COVID. Yes, I see that there is, uh, there are two of my bugbears on here. There's one about messages being sent via WhatsApp administrators <laughs> <laughs> needing to obtain consent. And uh, the other bugbear, thanks, Jim. This is a really great question on a challenging area for management on the issue of bring your own device. And I think especially in a COVID context where uh, businesses had to kind of just streamline um, as fast as possible last year to online and, and didn't have the time or the space to properly process the implications of, um, you know, the, bringing people bringing their own device to work and now that information that could be compromised. And I know, Gerald, you touched upon that in your discussion earlier today. And I think the first point to say is, you know, Unfortunately, the processor of the information will still be held liable. Um, you can show the steps for reasonableness. You can show that you trained your employees. You can show that you told them not to do this and that they you know, were negligent and they still carried on in spite of, of warnings. Um, but I think just educating people on the implications of what happens when a device is lost in that manner. And it's not always in a negligent manner. Um, we have to be aware of what is going on around us. And unfortunately, thefts do occur. Uh, people still have very shady security <laughs> principles that they abuse and have their passwords um, or auto logins on devices um, and, and not doing the bare minimum that's required. So. I think, you know, management has to take a firm stance because um, think about it, if a database with all your customers' information is now shared or and that breach occurs, it is man hours, it is, you know, monetary loss, it is reputational loss of just trying to kind of inform every single um, data subject that actually, you know, your information was lost, this is what happened, this is who you can report us to. Um, so yes, I think I, I agree with you, Jim, it is, a, it is a bit of a nightmare, it is a bit of a challenge. Um, 
but compliance in general is a bit of a challenge in all areas and we've got to make a concerted effort um, and we have to make people aware that there will be there are repercussions um, you know to data being breached I, I think I avoided the WhatsApp question draw I kept that one for you <laughs> okay I'll, I'll hand I'll tackle the WhatsApp one um uh, Jim, uh, on, on the BY, or the bring your own disaster question, um, I'm going to go back to, to my, my earlier session. Uh, there's a whole host of other reasons why BYOD is bad slash good outside of privacy. Uh, and I think if, if, if you can resolve those, um, those, other, those other reasons, then you're probably going to start covering a lot of the, the privacy requirements as well. Um, that said, BYOD can still be very, very challenging. I mean, within, within the example of the university, uh, students, uh, especially students with employee-like access uh, on, their, on their personal devices, we, we're faced with a very similar challenge. All right, WhatsApp. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to tackle this question from two sides. Uh, the first is from, let, let's say, WhatsApp usage in general. I think we need to be honest with ourselves that WhatsApp is a way of work in South Africa. Somehow, WhatsApp did a great job in about a decade ago in, in their market penetration in South Africa and it is a, is a way of work. And I'm gonna link back now to the justifications for the processing of personal information under the act. And I'm gonna provide an example from the university space. So let's say a lecturer creates a WhatsApp group for a class in order to enhance the teaching, especially in, in the context of what do they call it? Emergency remote teaching and learning and assessments, right? So we're creating this best intentions. This is, we, we're looking at legitimate interest now, if you remember the justifications. So this is definitely a legitimate interest of both the student and the lecturer and the university as a whole to get that teaching, that teaching happening in very trying circumstances. But the funny thing when relying on the legitimate interest justification is you, you need to provide space for the data subject to object. And often this also is linked to providing an alternate mechanism. So there may be a student for whatever reason that doesn't want to use WhatsApp or cannot use WhatsApp. And there could be a host of different reasons ranging from dislike in Facebook to simply not being able to afford uh, the technology and the data bundles required to access WhatsApp. It could be any number of reasons. It doesn't matter what the reason is, the lecturer in that in context must not prejudice the learning of that one student just because they can't access WhatsApp. So they must still provide provide the teaching, et cetera, that happens through WhatsApp through another channel. And in the context of the university, while we already have other channels that are more formal, et cetera, uh, our, our web-based learning, et cetera, and that's where we need to put it and that's where you grant the access and so on. So that's, that's one thing to consider with WhatsApp, depending on the nature of the group, All right? Um, you need to take into cognizance that um, that the justification for why people are in, in that group within the context of well, your job or your family or whatever the case may be, right? Then as for needing to obtain consent from all members, um, as I said, managing consent is, is a nightmare. And if you remember, um, if, if you remember from Jerusha's section, there are certain activities 
that uh, fall outside or not considered by Papia. So firstly, consider what is the nature of this group, all right? Nature of this group, it's, it's our family, completely household-oriented discussions and processing happening here. Fine. Fine. Or this is, we're following legitimate interest. That's our justification there. We're providing other mechanisms. Our other mechanisms are communicating with the student, in my example, via email, via our web learning platform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have alternatives. Uh, um, they can object, object air quotes, by exiting the group, withholding their phone number right at the start from, from being put on, et cetera. So those two examples, you don't need consent. Right, we've got legitimate interest justification or we have falls outside of Papia. But, you know, if, if, if all other justifications fail, for example, maybe you have a contract with somebody that says that includes having access to WhatsApp or blah, blah, blah. If all other justifications fail, then, then you do need consent again. You know, but check, you'll, you'll probably, you, I think I can't, I can't think of an example where, where consent will be the only justification available for a WhatsApp group. Uh, I, I, I really can't. So all these others would apply. And of course, you can just walk away from a group. You can just exit a group. So I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Um, I wouldn't lose sleep about WhatsApp groups like that. And that was a very roundabout way of saying that. Okay, well, are there any more questions? Okay, here's one. How do we balance all the new legislative requirements such as the draft national policy on data and cloud? Oof, this, this, is, this is tricky. Um, so I can only speak from our experience uh, where we are, where we encounter the, the, the Venn diagram of Paya and Popier and, and how they overlap. Uh, so on the one hand is access to the information and the other hand is, is, is privacy. And we, we take a view of trying to, that these are not opposing acts. We try to read in, into them that they are to, to harmonize be, between the two. I mean, we've two opposing rights. Um, for example, in Pyre, um, I don't wanna start listing sections sections now, but the, but the way in which they, they interact is, 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 is surprisingly elegant. Um, and get, getting that better understanding of personal information from the Papia perspective really helps in responding to requests about uh, on a PIA perspective. And um, whenever we're faced with a PIA query well, and we see that section 34, which is the section on, on the information of a third party who is a natural person triggers, we keep Papia next to us to help us with the interpretation of that. Um, I, it is my, my wish that all of our legislation can be, can be read in such a way, um, but as there is limited case law, it's very, very difficult to say at this moment um, about how exactly do we balance which one, which one trumps which. It's very, very difficult for us to say. That said, if you're practicing good information governance and good information management, records management and security, et cetera, third party risk management and everything else, a lot of your, a lot of the concerns and troubles should, should be dealt with as a happy byproduct. Hmm. I said the question is the new 
draft policy wants us to collect more data, but Papier wants us to minimum as little as possible. Well, if in that sense, how I would read that is uh, that national policy then establishes the minimum. Uh, the, the problem is if you look in historically and you haven't collected that, then that becomes a, another question we can position with the regulator. Henri, I'm scanning the questions. I think we got all to all of them, but let us know if we missed one. That looks like that's all the questions. Um, so from our side, it's like we'd like to thank you, Gerald and Jerusha, for taking the time out and presenting at um, our event. And thank you for sharing your experiences around data purpose in Poppy. I think it's quite insightful. Um, I think it's going to give us you know, a bit more knowledge about how do we handle tomorrow, which is D-Day. But thank you really so much. Um, I know if we can go on to the next slide. Next slide, thank you. Um, and then just to keep a look out, we do have um, a number of other events. So, so June and July are considered our Poppy uh, Awareness Fund. Um, so we do have another event scheduled, uh, I think in the next few weeks, so do keep a look out on that. And we'll try our best to keep you informed of uh, you know, any Poppy um, related announcements, as well as keep you up to date with um, any you know, things happening there and share some insights in terms of that can help you with your puppy journey. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then for the Isaka African Chapter Awards, the nominations are open. Um, so please do, if you know of any fellow members that have been quite outstanding within the profession, um, please send the nomination through to Isaka and to the office. You can either email them. There's more information as well um, that's available on the website. Next slide, please, Henry. But essentially, this brings our event to a close. Again, to our speakers, thank you so much again for you know providing us with these insights on Poppy. Um, to our audience, thank you for taking time out and attending, and thank you for your attention. Um, you know, in cognizance of um, this being Poppy Eve, we're going to play you out with a very special item. Um, but and given that, I hope everyone stays safe during these times. So I hope to keep well, and until the next forum, we'll see you soon. Goodbye.